Okay, here is a periodic table. You've seen it before. I know we give you periodic tables when you start. That periodic table needs to be your best friend. I need you to be extremely familiar with it. I need you to have it with you anytime any of us says, let's pull out the periodic table. We have to teach classes in a lot of rooms where there's not a periodic table mounted on the wall. I don't understand that. How can you have an educational establishment in which every single room doesn't have a periodic table? But these weirdo biologists and historians and stuff apparently don't like it on there. But anyway, so we give you one. you got to have it with you. Now, this is the one we've done up ourselves. Swansea University, Department of Chemistry. Seals all over the place. Little uh, wavy line thing here that kind of gets lost and distracting. Um, however, it's, it's a nice one to have and pretty little colours. But I would prefer to teach from... The Royal Society of Chemistry Periodic Table. This is an interactive periodic table. You can find it at this website. It's actually really fun to play with when you're bored and you don't want to do anything weird and you've finished watching all those University of Nottingham videos on the elements. This is a great thing to go to. Anyway, the bulk of this movie is going to be very dry and it's things that I want you to have memorized. Okay, first of all, periodic table. The rows are called periods, the columns are called groups, and those groups all have names. You'll know the alkali metals. That's that first column except for hydrogen. Hydrogen is weird. Back in the days when I could say things like this, I would call hydrogen an Aggie element because Aggies in Texas were the people that you told jokes about. Now you can't tell jokes about people. So therefore, I would just call hydrogen an undecided element. But one thing it is very definitely not, it is not a metal. So even though it is here in the periodic table, um, on top of lithium, sodium, potassium and so on, it is not an alkali metal. The alkali metals start at lithium. <clears throat> we'll talk in a couple of movies, of course, if you don't already know, about why hydrogen is there on the periodic table. Now, in my day, being the old crusty fart I was, you always knew that the first group, first column were alkali metals and the second column were the alkaline earth metals. However, that appears to have disappeared from uh, the education system, but that's no excuse for you. I want you to know it. If I say alkaline earth metals, you will immediately know to go to the second column. You will know that the most common examples of this are magnesium and calcium, but also beryllium, strontium, barium and radium are friends with them as well. This middle chunk here are called the transition metals. Um, now, there are those who would say that zinc and cadmium and mercury are not transition metals. I know why they say it. I don't think they're stupid for saying it. But if you don't include them in the transition metals, they get all left out and sad and lonely. So we are going to include them in the transition metals because we will be using fairly soon another term that is synonymous with transition metals that very definitely includes zinc, cadmium and mercury. You have the so-called inner transition metals. If you look down here, lanthanum is number 57, <clears throat> hafnium is number 72. So either the person who made the periodic table can't count or is there something else going on. And what's going on is that you have the inner transition metals 58 through 71 come down from there and 90 through 103 pop down from in here. The reason they're pulled out is very simply because if you're stuck them back in, the periodic table would be too long and skinny to fit on a piece of paper nicely. That seriously is why they're there. But anyway, these are the inner transition metals and their particular names that we will use a little bit in your first year of the, the main a three-year bachelor's course, but then come back to right at the very end of the final year. Lanthanides, based on lanthanum, 57, then leaps down 58 through 71. The lanthanides go in there, and the actinides go in here, <coughs> named after actinium. Now, this whole group here are called the P block elements for reasons that we will see later on. They also have their own names and because trying to squeeze it in here becomes really sort of messy, we'll move to another slide. Now they are extracted in their full glory. 
Everybody, I trust, knows that the final column are collectively known as the noble gases, starting with helium, which is very definitely a noble gas, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, and argonesium. Um, you also know, I hope, that the halogens are the group before that, starting with fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine are the four that you need to remember. Now, that's probably as far as your education has taken you up till now. However, some of you might have been told that the group starting with oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, polonium are the chalcogens. Very few of you will have been told that the group before that are the nictogens. And then I bet nobody has ever been told, unless I've told you it before, that the group before that are either the tetrels or the crystallogens. Some people call them the carbon group because they don't want to use really cool names. And a group before that, the one starts with boron, that some people call the boron group, which is very boring. Trials or icosogens. <clears throat> I love icosogens and crystallogens. So that will be how I refer to those every time the concept comes up in every future lecture that you will ever get from me. I would like you to know those names. They're all really cool words anyway. Now, when going through the periodic table, those of you in the foundation course, we did this in the video right before it. Those of you not in the foundation course, you will should have already known this. And that is that the periodic table is broken down pretty much into metals and non-metals, separated by this dividing line here. Metals, of course, are shiny ductile, malleable, conduct heat, conduct electricity. You could have told that these ones over on the left of the periodic table are metals because of the group names. These are the alkali metals. These are the alkaline earth metals. These are the transition metals. These are the inner transition metals. OK, now separated by this line here, are the metals from the non-metals. <clears throat> metals are shiny ductile, malleable, conduct heat, conduct electricity. Non-metals over here. Um, in some cases, they might be shiny, ductile, malleable, conduct heat, conduct electricity. Carbon, for example, in its form of graphite, conducts electricity rather well. But the important thing is they're not all of them all at the same time. Now, the elements in this dividing line, boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium, <clears throat> are known collectively as the metalloids. OK, they're in between properties, right? Some people call these semi-metals. Now, there is, you think chemistry is all nice and cut and dry and objective. There's a lot of debate about this. First of all, polonium down here is radioactive. Nobody messes around trying to see if it's shiny, malleable and so on. Um, same thing for astatine. Nobody messes around to see what that is because it is radioactive. There are those people who say that these are also metalloids. There are those who say that astatine is a non-metal and polonium is a metalloid. There are those who say polonium is a metal and astatine is a metalloid. There are those who say polonium is a metal and astatine is a non-metal. In other words, you can find every single permutation of it. Um, we will discuss in a later module all of the finer points of those. I'm also seeing, very distressingly, um, a lot of people, including the textbook that we use for the first year, claiming that boron is a non-metal. That is totally bogus, politically correct crap, something probably Donald Trump will come up with as he is negating the whole effect of climate change. Boron is in the University of Swansea Chemistry Department a metalloid. And of course, as already mentioned, old hydrogen up there, weirdo, stuck with the metals. It is very, very distinctly and definitively a non-metal. There are actually some reports that when you make it so cold that it's a solid, then one form of it can have some metallic properties, but that's just getting weird. We are going to always call it a non-metal. So anyway, I would really like it if you all know where the metalloids are, everything to the left of those except old hydrogen is a metal, everything to the right is a non-metal. I'd also like you to know the group names. It would be remiss if we left this without a final discussion about some of the issues with the periodic table and why we gave you a periodic table to use, because there is debate about it, which uh, some of that debate would be taken care of by people getting together and talking to each other nicely. Um, some of that debate would be taken care of by having a long skinny periodic table instead of the one that fits nicely in landscape format on an A4. And uh, some of it would go away if people could just get along, you know. But 
anyway, it was a nice little article here that I've linked in. came out in 2012 that you might want to have a little bit of a read. Um, Eric Skerry, it gets a few things wrong. He's the author of it, but by and large, it's a fun thing to um, to read. And there are a couple of things that I want to pull out of it and point out to you. First is group numbers. When I was a young person in chemistry class, I would stare up at a periodic table that had been produced by the Royal Society of Chemistry that had these as the group numbers. OK, um, the first one was group 1A. And it was a Roman numeral 1, then 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A. Then something that confused me greatly back when I was a young whippersnapper in short trousers and just out of diapers was that then you had these three here, this kind of triad as group 8. And it didn't have a letter after it. And then you started again with 1B, 2B, 3B, 4B, 5B, 6B, 7B. And then the noble gases were group 0. Now, that was the numbering scheme, the group numbering scheme that was used in the UK and Europe. It was particularly nice because, as you'll see later on, it makes a lot of sense to have this as one, the alkali metals with hydrogen as one, the alkaline earths as two, and then the icosogens as three, crystallogens four, nitrogens five, chalcogens six, halogens seven, and then, yeah, you might as well throw noble gases in there as a big zero. These ones didn't matter too much what the numbers were, for reasons you'll see in a minute, and it just went the sort of AAAA and then BBBBB. Now, of course, the Americans had to be different. So the CAS, right, the Chemical Abstract Services, had its own numbering scheme. They agreed on 1A and 2A. They agreed on the 3s and 4s and the 5s and the 6s and the 7s, but they disagreed on the letters. Have you noticed how Americans can't spell? I can say that because I've got an American passport. Um, but anyway, so instead of scandium being group 3A, they switched that to the Bs. So their transition metals all had Bs as their letter okay and this actually is a bit more satisfying because yeah here's all the b's all together and indeed we'll even emphasize that eight is eight b because it's a transition metal and then they stayed to the three four five six seven and so on but now they called those a's and then because again they can't agree instead of saying the noble gases are zeros they're actually eights and we come back to that significantly when we talk about atoms doing things to get happy so anyway again this was lovely and this was what i lived for um, all the way through my A-levels, my degrees, I was on the green numbering system, went to the States um, to do my graduate studies and they switched the A's for the B's in most cases except the alkali metals and the alkali nurse, but it wasn't that big a deal. And what was really important, as again you'll see later on, is the idea of one and two and then three, four, five, six, seven, and then this eight or zero even makes sense. It was wonderful. But anyway, because there was this transatlantic disparity starting in the mid 80s and uh, concluded in the early 90s, the IUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry said, why can't we all agree on something? And so just use numbers. And this is what I'm sure you have seen in many cases. They just start counting at one and keep counting until they get up to 18. So the noble gas is a group 18. The crystallogens are group 14 and so on. Now, while this makes a lot of sense in terms of using modern numbers and getting rid of the ambiguities, you actually lose that three, four five six seven and then eight or zero that as we will see is a very very important aspect of trying to explain and relate some of the chemistry of the elements and the atoms to the periodic table so anyway debate about the numbering schemes i will use different ones depending on the points i want to make sometimes i'll be politically correct and use the ones in red more often than not i will issue the letters and just say for example that carbon is in group four okay now not content with not being able to count other people decided that they wanted to change the format of the periodic table. And in particular, I want you to look at this little area here where we have 55, 56, 57, and then we leap down 87, 88, 89, and then we leap down. The RSC has it right, okay? You go one into the transition metals before you leap down to the inner transition metals. 
However, there are some periodic tables where they get confused and they say, let's do the leap instead of after 57, we'll do it after 56. So this one here, you can see goes 56, 57, 58, blah, 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 all the way up to 70, and then brings 71 back up here. Down here, instead of it going 87, 88, 89, and then leaping down to 90, it goes 87, 88, down to 89, cross to 102, back up for 103. Now, in a later video in the first year chemistry course, we will discuss the reasons why they do this. It's not completely inane. It's a bit stupid. It loses some of the purpose of the periodic table, but it's not totally silly. Fortunately, this type of periodic table is dying out. It was extremely common in the 90s and the early part of the 2000s, but I haven't been able to find it nearly as much um, since then, which is why I had to go to a schooltutoring.com website to pull this particular version out. So you'd think that's good, wouldn't you? You'd think, OK, people are returning to the way it should be with the RSC, where it goes 55, 56, 57, and then you leap down. Unfortunately, increasingly, and also pushed and adopted by many Americans, is the periodic table that I call We Can't Make Up Our Mind. What we have here is we have 55, 56, and then it leaps down, and then it goes all the way down to 71 before coming up to 72. In other words, there are gaps here. And you'll often find versions where it says 57 through 71, 89 through 103. This is a horrible periodic table. This is one that completely loses the plot of what one is trying to do with parts of the periodic table, and that is relate the orders of the atoms, of the elements, and the position of the elements to their properties. It loses so much. I really beg you that if you see a periodic table where there is this big gap here and the inner transition metal block is not 14 but is 15 columns wide, that you throw that periodic table away and get a real periodic table. I would urge you strongly bring the periodic table that we give you to class. Use it when you're doing your homework because it is the best and the right one. And also, please learn those group names, learn the identity of the metalloids so that we can talk quite happily and easily about the structure of the periodic table and use it without having to go back and explain all the time what an icosogen is and so forth. Anyway, enjoy.